CHGO White Sox podcast coming to you live from Studio A of our CHGO offices here in the West Loop of Chicago. I'm your host, Sean Anderson. Alongside me, the full CHGO White Sox crew. Hot off the presses is Vinny Duber's Die Hard Mailbag. You can go check that out at allchgo.com. If you are a diehard, you can follow Vinny at Vinny Duber on Twitter. The man in the middle is Herb Lawrence. Hello. You can follow him at Ekrawal23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. And uh, you can follow us at CHGO underscore White Sox. I'm Sean Anderson. You can follow me at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. Thank you to everyone for hanging out with us. Make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the CHGO Sports YouTube channel. We got, I think, a pre and post game for the Blackhawks tonight. The Bulls take on the Lakers tomorrow. And the CHGO Bulls crew will have you covered then. And obviously, if you are fiending for Bears coverage, uh, we have you covered five days a week and also twice on Monday with Bears After Dark. So, Why aren't you subscribed, folks? Uh, Today on our White Sox show, we'll be discussing Mark Burley's chances over the next six years to make it into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, I also got, well, not I got it, but we got an update on maybe where Colson Montgomery might stand uh, to MLB Pipeline. And for people who have been holding out hope for the vest, there is the promotion that is going to be giving out the vest this year in 2024, the 2005 uh, vest. But there might be some... I don't know, news to to quell any excitement for maybe the the return of the vest. Uh, So we'll get into that later on in the show. How are you guys? You guys good? You're looking at me weird. No, doing swell. It's it's wet outside. It is. Good observation. I had to go put air in the tires Mm. uh, at the uh, gas station, and I parked in like a little mini lake uh, (laughs) up up on uh, Clark Street up there. So, so yeah, so uh, the, 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 the boots survived, the car survived. Uh, but yes, it, I, I was looking around for a paddle for a minute there. Happy to hear it. What was your favorite question ask, uh, answering in the uh, mailbag? I haven't read it yet because literally it's hot off the yeah, presses. Yeah, it literally was just published. So everybody who's a diehard, go check that out. If you're not a diehard, go to allchgo.com. Consider becoming a diehard. You get access to that and all sorts of other cool stuff, which I'm sure we'll talk about later in the show during an ad read at some point. But uh, the question that I got that I loved was I, we had one of our great uh, uh, regulars who lives overseas said he's coming in to Chicago for uh, a little uh, trip in the summer. Asked me the one bar that he should go to. Mm. And, of course, I cheated and named, like, eight. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, hey, you got to fill fill the, <laughs> the space, you know? They're giving you the room to – there's no limit. There's Character no limit. limit. Right. Exactly. I mean, just Chicago, give us your you thoughts. You can't just pick one bar. Exactly. I, so I, I went with a bunch of different, like, categories of bars and then gave him one for each category. Because I don't know what he likes to drink. There's 77 neighborhoods. He likes Maybe he likes a beer. Maybe he likes a beer fresh from a brewery. Maybe he likes a whiskey drink. Maybe he likes a vodka drink. Yeah, keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tub Thumping. Yes. Uh, all right. So uh, what were half of those guys. Mm. Uh, <laughs> grand opening, grand closing. Yeah, they still sing that song. Probably. My my dad bought the CD. Did he? Did oh he? yeah. Was it that existed in our there? house? No, there were like ten. No one ever listened to and anything about terrible. the one. Who it's knows? Weird. Who knows? They could have been amazing, but who knows? <laughs> it's kind of an unforgettable album cover. It's that weird, like green. The purple baby Hubbard, or yeah. the pink baby, yeah. Odd. All right. Uh, all share your teeth. favorite tub thumping song in the comments. Is there teeth? The baby, I think, is, I has a big like, smile. The yeah. color of being like yeah. lime green. Um, oh, yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Very wow. odd. <laughs> Don't look it up. Uh, all right. I do want to address something real quick because I did see this on Twitter, uh, and White Sox Tom is sharing it in the comments. Mm. Uh, Todd Helton's a Hall of Famer. Yes. Uh, White Sox Tom saying Paul Konerko belongs in the Hall of Fame. I love White Sox fans. They're my favorite. But if you do look at the comparison between Todd Helton and Paul Konerko, the only thing that Paul Konerko beats Todd Helton on is OPS plus. Or uh, not OPS plus, home runs. Yes. Uh, So, you know, Todd Helton, it's great to see a Rocky, a true Rocky get in the Hall of Fame. I don't know if we have any thoughts on 
uh, Helton, if we have any thoughts on Beltre, who nearly was a unanimous first yeah, about uh, that? first ballot Hall of Famer, uh, or no, I'm blanking. It's not Billy Wagner. I want to say Billy Wagner. It's Mauer. Mr. Mauer. Joe Mauer. Oh, Joe yeah. Mauer, of course. Well played, uh, Mauer. The first player from the born in the 80s to make the Hall of Fame, the first player drafted in the 2000s to be elected into the Hall of Fame, and the first player that's career was encapsulated in the 21st century uh, being enshrined in the Hall of Fame, Joe Mauer. Really? And I, it's, you know, I'd have to go through and look at some of the other folks, but I think the first, maybe the first person that I've had a one-on-one interview with to make the Hall of Fame. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I wrote a nice story for MLB.com the year I interned there. He was an all-star. Unsurprisingly, he was in the Hall of Fame. Uh, and I wrote, I wrote a, I, I had an interview with Joe Maurer just at one of those little media day things and wrote a story uh, about his um, relationship with the then Royals groundskeeper, uh, who was the uh, spring groundskeeper for the Twins. He did the spring training uh, groundskeeping for the Twins stadium. So Joe Maurer knew him, uh, and so I, I was able to talk to him about, uh, about that gentleman. And so there you go. That might be, might be the case. I don't know. What year was that? 2012. Nice. Congratulations. That's very cool. Uh, yeah. I didn't make the Hall of Fame. It's okay. <laughs> That's true. Uh, Joe Maurer elected by four votes, and then uh, Billy Wagner missed being elected by five votes. Uh, Wagner, though, I believe still has one more year of eligibility, so you'd assume that he'd make it in. Um, any thoughts on the three that made it in? Any thoughts on Wagner? Obviously, we'll stretch our legs on Burley, but uh, what do we make of Helton, Beltre, and Maurer, Herb? I get White Sox Tom wanting to have Paul Konerko in. Yes, you saw him. Great. Awesome. I get it. But Todd Helton, if we're comparing war, and I don't know if you're there, but if we're comparing war, which is not the be-all, end-all, but it is pretty well uh, regarded as a place where you can measure different eras, Todd Helton was a 61. Mark Burley, I mean, uh, Paul Konerko was like in 28. So... It's a big disparity there, and as you said, there's nothing that Paul Konerko did better than Todd Helton than hit home runs. And I think Todd Helton, for so long, and I think this was what his first or, or his third or second time sixth. on the uh, sixth time on the ballot. Yeah, he's been God, out for a while. Damn, yeah, that's way too long. I think people are punishing him because of the atmosphere of Colorado, but the guy was a player. The guy was awesome for the what, 16 years he was in Colorado, you can't punish him for being on a team that happened to have all these extra things. And he exceeded, and he excelled in in Colorado. I don't know what his uh, road splits were, but I'm sure they weren't just like, hey, I'm hitting 380 in Colorado, and I'm hitting 240 on the road. But, yeah, Paulie's great, and I think that he got his postseason or post-career accolades as the statue and the number retirement from the White Sox, which is enough for most people. And Paul Konerka will tell you himself. But um, Joe Maurer, one of the best catchers I've seen with my own eyes. Of course, the White Sox fan, we know he was much better in the Metro dump than he was at the, the Tent Twins field now. And I think that Adrian Beltre, there's only one player at third base that's better than him, and that's Michael Jack Schmidt. It. Everybody else is below him. Even the people to now, like the Nolan Arenados, the Manny Machados of the world, Adrian Beltre did it both with the glove and the bat like no other player did except for Mike Schmidt. I push back on that. I mean, I don't know how much you consider A-Rod a third baseman. I also don't know how much you consider him because of the steroids, but yes. I take A-Rod. I've also heard a lot about Brooks Robinson. Defensively. I don't know. He was a great defensive player. I mean, Hell, he had 105 OPS plus, still oh, yeah. above was, average. I he mean, he's great defensive player. But. 16 gold gloves this ain't too shabby. Um, I get your point. Maybe all around uh, a player for for sure. Uh, Todd Helton, though, also just to add on, uh, top 20 uh, since 1920 in on base percent, just below Wade Boggs and just above Melot. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Remember that time he almost hit 400, too? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Todd Helton career, uh, home and away, uh, one. 048 OPS at home, 855 uh, on the road. So worse, but still, he's at 855 on the road OPS. I mean, that's pretty damn good. I mean, it too, he was just like, it wasn't, he was just a worse hitter, not because like the balls in play were going further. He just, he, uh, struck out more, walked less, uh, 661 strikeouts on the road compared to 625 uh, walks. Uh, at home, 710 walks compared to 514 strikeouts. So, like, just a completely different home hitter. Just 
just maybe more comfortable. Played there for 17 years. Well, and what I would say, too, to the to the whole course Field thing is, like, if it's that easy, then everybody would put up Todd Helton numbers. But right. his numbers were Hall of Fame worthy. Not everybody else's were. You know what I mean? We'd be talking about all these guys who played for the Rockies as Hall of Fame candidates, and, and we don't. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We talk about one or two guys, the two certainly the two guys who are in who, who hit for the Rockies and, and maybe only a small handful moving forward. So uh, all three of those guys, man, they, they just – they just made hit and easy. They just made yeah. hit and look easy. And you know, I think it, it was funny. I had a, a text from a from a, a friend of mine who's a Sox fan that said after after uh, Joe Mauer got in yesterday that said every at bat of Joe Mauer's career ended in a du- opposite field double against the White Sox. Yes. And it's like you know what I mean. It's like <laughs> if if you if you were a White Sox fan and you watched them play the Twins during that time when Joe Mauer was uh, was playing for them, you know how good Joe Mauer was. And there are tons of other fan bases. Uh, or several other fan bases, I should say, who know that. Plenty of other people who watched and get votes who know that. So to me, Joe Maurer, no doubt, Hall of Famer. Beltre, same way. Helton, same way. So I'm glad to see that for all three of those guys because, man, they were the epitome of just consistency and being really, really damn good. <laughs> to, to be fair to our White Sox, uh, the White Sox kept him under 300 lifetime uh, batting average. Finished at 298. So. Ha! <laughs> How many Take du- that, Joe Maurer. like 50 doubles in that? Career versus the White Sox? Uh, yeah, 53. Yeah. <laughs> 18, 53 doubles, eight, 18 homers, 105 ribbies, 109 walks, 119 strikeouts. That guy what didn't strike bum. out a lot. And they, they, what a bum. Hey, uh, 298 batting average, 384 on base, 438 slug, a cool 822 OPS for a catcher. Yeah, Only um, 384 on base? Yeah. I mean, honestly, they, they kind of limited him. I mean... I, uh, 384. That's unbelievable. <laughs> and he joins, what, Harold Baines, Ken Griffey Jr. as first picks overall in the draft who made the Hall of Fame? I guess, yeah. You clearly know that stat more than I do. I think there might be another one. I mean, of course, A-Rod will be there once he gets there. I don't think he will, though. I think he eventually will get there. I mean, a- I don't know about voted in, but he'll get there. All these steroids guys who would otherwise be a uh, Hall of Famer, I think, are going to get. That's going to require. That's going to require some special yeah. rule making, though. You know what I mean? That's going to be like. And I'm in no way drawing any comparison to these two groups of players, other than the way that the other one I'm about to talk about got into the Hall of Fame. You'll remember several years ago when they put a whole bunch of Negro Leagues players into the Hall of Fame at once, basically just saying. Those guys all belong in the Hall of Fame. Because of the way the voting works, they were not able to be put in in the traditional manner. We're going to do this one-time thing where we put them all in together. Maybe 20, 30 years down the road, there's a new commissioner who feels a different way and says, hey, we have a story of our game being told with a pretty big hole in the middle of it. Let's go ahead and rectify that kind of all at once. It would take that kind of action, I think. I don't think you're going to see like, oh, every... Five years when the whatever committee votes on so and so, two more steroid guys get in, kind of thing. Like because then you're then it's like, well, what did that guy do to deserve it this time versus that guy? You have to pick who goes on those ballots, even. Yeah. So um, I think it's going to take someday in the future, probably decades down the road, a entirely different climate and a commissioner who is ready to say, let's go ahead and do that kind of thing. A Rod in his third year, uh, under thirty five percent of the vote, uh, thirty four point eight. Manny's in his eighth season, thirty two point five percent of the vote. You think both of those guys would be Hall of Famers if you know they didn't have the the steroid light around them? Obviously, McGuire uh, and Bonds just came off uh, the. You know, it was McGuire. Clemens. Clemens. Yeah, the other guy. Uh, McGuire Clemens, has also yeah. since come and gone, but yeah. uh, Sosa as well. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, uh, Clemens and Bonds just got taken off the ballot. Uh, you'd assume that the Baseball Hall of Fame would want to honor that. Like it's maybe not honor that, but again, you said there's a hole there. Like the steroid era is baseball's biggest era. I think. So many fans were created just because of Sports Center and the way that you could just watch those highlights well, for an hour straight. Just that certainly that within media. our recent memory, I think there was a time when baseball yeah. was everything to the entire country. You know what I mean? But in recent memory of the way we think about it, competing with other sports of interest, that's what you're talking about in the way it came back from the strike. Yes, that is a big, big chapter. And yeah. it's not like <laughs> MLB's Hall of Fame. I assume that MLB is a large donor to the Hall of Fame. Um, but again, it's not what, what like Major League Baseball is not honoring these people. It is Cooperstown, New York's Baseball Hall of Fame. They, I don't know. Barry Bonds played baseball. I just don't get it. Like it's, uh, the same, it's the same discussion kind of that we had with the 
17 uh, Black White, Sox. Yeah. Um, like, again, they're infamous, but should they still not have, like, a little plaque, a little story? Like, hey, they won, they, uh, won a championship well, or they threw a championship? Like, I haven't been to Cooperstown. I I'm going – I will make sure to go one day, but I would imagine that – there is the museum part of it, which does tell that yeah. part of the story, right? And so, um, you know, I'm sure you can go find plenty of traces of Barry Bonds and Sammy Sosa and Roger Clemens in the Baseball Hall of Fame. It's just whether they are enshrined as, you know, inductees, that kind of thing. So, uh, but like I said, I think somewhere down the road, there'll be an entirely different thought process of this part of history. Uh, and I think that you will see those guys in maybe eventually, but the way that they go in is going to be unique. It's not going to be probably under the current mechanism. That makes sense, too. And it probably will be after all the people who had watched and witnessed their career are probably gone. And maybe those people themselves are gone, too. Because just imagine if you are 100 years from now and you look at that museum, and you're like, hey, why isn't the home run leader in the Hall of Fame? Oh, yeah, he did some st well, steroids are common now. You don't know in 100 years what's going to be common. And now they're like, as you say, Vinny, they're just gonna like, okay, this was an era, and these players didn't get voted in for various reasons, mostly because of their steroid use, or uh, alleged steroid use. And as uh, Thomas says, put an ex exhibit there and say, alleged steroid use, put a fucking asterisk if you want to, cool. But they need to be enshrined. Because we know that you, yourself, you said that you became a fan because of Sammy Sosa and, and Mark McGuire right. and A-Rod. I'm sure there are people out here who are watching, looking, like, those are my guys. I wanted to see that excitement. I wanted to be in 98 and see all those home runs being hit. That was my stuff. That's why I got into baseball. Well, and I would say this, too. You already see the attitude toward that thing changing. I mean, I, mean, I remember back being a kid when all that stuff came out and it was like, oh, Barry Bonds used steroids and it was like, oh, oh no. my God, call Congress. <laughs> we need to get Congress on this. And now it's like, Fernando Tatis Jr. did steroids. He got suspended and he'll be back soon. Right. You know what I've I mean? Like, it's steroids. not like an, it's not like an, it's not treated like an end of the world thing anymore. Man. Sarah wants to chime in. I, I've taken steroids. Oh, really? Hey, hey, yeah. hey, yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was, I had a Quite really, admission. I had a really bad ton tonsil like infection a few years ago. So they gave me steroids and nice. it, fixed my life did it, you hit well i'll tell you i recovered really okay. fast oh. <laughs> but, sarah yeah. sarah had a career career high in ops that i could have played <laughs> well i mean i guess that's also like the the argument too is like would barry bonds be that good at 44 if he was no. taking steroids right Obviously. um so again how how true was the performance and you even bring up the home run king and the chat's bringing up that the hit king isn't even the hall of fame as well that uh for also true. a completely different reason yep. um which he should be yeah, so. I mean, again, I mean, uh, right. Pete Rose's performance didn't change because he was gambling. Probably a terrible um, person, but it, we're just enshrining people who played baseball and played it well. He should be in, and Chillis Joe should be in, all those people. We'll take a break in a second, but, like, I mean, even, too, with the McGuire thing, like, in that uh, 30 for 30, like, he's got anabolic steroids in his locker as guys are around him interviewing him, and there's cameras. Like, it wasn't. A rule. And it was, yeah, it wasn't. A, <laughs> you fucked up, baseball. It, That's on you. Yeah, theoretically, it wasn't a rule in their CBA. It was illegal to take steroids in the United States. But again, guys, let's remember this, too. Who's making these voting decisions? You know what I mean? 40-something percent of the voters who do not work for Major League Baseball determined they don't want Alex Rodriguez in the Hall of Fame, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and far and a far smaller percent. Just, you know, think of the tiny voting numbers that, that Sammy Sosa got. Think of the tiny voting numbers, uh, you know, that went to some of these other guys who are definitely, um, you know, their statistics are definitely worthy of it. You know, it, it's easy to paint with a broad brush, but I think, too, these are some of the intricacies of the process, mm -hmm. and I think the process is a good process, but these are the intricacies of it. It's like everybody gets to make their own call on, on, on what they determine. We can disagree with them, absolutely, but you're di disagreeing with each individual voter, not necessarily with the wide swath of rulemaking or anything like that. We need to get Vinny a, a vote. When do you get a vote? You should get one soon, right? I mean, you have to uh, qualify, if I but... If I... If, if I continue to get my card, I will have a vote in about five years, I think. Okay. Yes. Hell yeah. Congrats, man. But we'll see. Hey, you'll, you know who you'll be able to vote for? Hopefully. Mark Burley. Because mm, he's got six years of eligibility. Oh, so if he perhaps. lasts six years. If he, yeah, if he lasts there yeah. long. 
Perhaps. I don't know. I'd have to we'll count it. I'd have to count it up. Let's I'll see. But All right. Yeah. Let's uh, <laughs> let's jump into the break and then uh, we'll have any count. Uh, why don't we let you people know about our friends over at ComEd? It's getting easier for businesses to switch to electric vehicles. It's something that we can all get behind for the health of the planet, and for the well-being of all of us who share it. That's a great point, Sean. The electric grid is evolving to meet your cleaner energy needs as we all move with confidence toward an electric tomorrow. Whether you have one delivery van or a whole fleet of shipping trucks, ComEd can help guide you to make the changes that make sense. What should business owners do, Vin? What they should do is go to comed.com slash clean to learn more about the resources, fleet rebates, and infrastructure incentives available to help businesses go electric. If you, yes, you own a business, don't wait. Start making your plan today to switch to electric vehicles. They're good for business, good for the planet, and good for all of us. Go to comed.com slash clean. Did you say comed.com slash clean? clean indeed i did go now and see how going electric connects us to a better way of doing business and a better future for generations to come and gentlemen we all know the number to call for this next company 588-2300 empire today uh we want to let you know about our friends over at empire today who apparently decked out our friends at PHNX's studio with some new floors. Uh, looks very cool. You can go look at at CHGO underscore sports uh, to check that out. Never thought that I'd say that flooring looks very cool, but I'm actually kind of jealous. I, I kind of wish we had nice floors. I mean, our floors aren't bad. Ooh, um, really these are nice. See? We can use a, a upgrade, though. I, I feel like we could. Uh, so if they're providing new flooring for the PHNX studios, I feel like they could do it for us. Uh, with Empire Today, you get shop at home convenience, the right product for your needs, quick and professional installation, and a low price guarantee. Empire Today is the best place to get new flooring, so of course they have copycats, but Empire cannot be beaten on their quality, service, and speed. So competitors advertise low-quality products that Empire simply won't carry. Empire won't promise lowest prices because anyone who does is putting flooring in your home that they wouldn't put in theirs. Empire keeps shopping for floors simple with a curated product selection, and their philosophy is to help you find what you need, not overwhelm you with thousands of choices. What they leave out of their selection is just as important as what they put in. Empire's product team exhaustively combs thousands thousands of product samples each year to find the perfect styles and you can check out those styles with their virtual floor designer it's a great way to see how new floors will look in any space it's easy just snap a picture and instantly see how new floors will look in your room so schedule a free in-home estimate today with our friends over at empire all listeners can receive a 350 dollars off discount when they use promo code chgo restrictions apply see empire today.com slash chgo for details all right so mark burley um did you do that math, by the way? Yes. Okay. So I believe, so I believe I've had five seasons worth of BBWA membership. I believe I need five more to qualify. So that would put me in line to vote. What five years from now, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Burley has six after years. the tenth season. So yeah, I think you might have twenty twenty nine class might be my either the twenty twenty nine or the twenty thirty would be my first. Okay, I, I think that would be. His second to last year, uh, or second or last year, uh, okay. on the on the ballot. So his last year, if might he be makes your it, first if he ballot. stays, right. Yes. Uh, yeah. Obviously, we'll talk about that. Um, you talked about having issues with maybe more specific voters. Um, first, I want to kind of congratulate the BBWA voters um, because they have gotten, I think, more inclusive and 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 just uh, becoming what I want to see in the Baseball Hall of Fame, which is maybe less gatekeeping. I want to see more 10 player val ballots. I want to see more names being added on. If you have the ability to add 10 players, I think you should do it. Right? And whether the more that's the merrier. whether that's people whether that's individual voters evolving or the voting base evolving as it right. gets newer members every single year, right? So, um Again, you know, I mean, I think we've got a comment there from from Matthew saying like, "Oh, the standards have been inconsistent." It's like the standards are each are each voters. You know what I mean. You can determine it. And hey, one one year, maybe one voter who has been completely anti steroid guys or completely in this case anti Mike, Mark Burley, right? right, thinks about it a little harder and says, "Boy, now I got a different opinion." And and I think I think that's a I think that's a good thing. I understand that it might make for some inconsistency, but I I think it's a good thing that you've got a bunch of different people weighing this decision as best they can. We talked about it kind of because it's a similar process when we were talking about uh, you know, end of season awards and yeah. and how, you know, different people have different opinions on what each award on, on what uh types of players deserve each award and that you have that diversity of thought I think is a very good thing. Yeah, and I think that um as long as 
you if you do change your mind. And most of these uh, BBWAA uh, members do put out a, a article with their vote when they do make it public and explain their reasoning for changing their vote, having a difference of opinion on some person that is obviously a Hall of Famer, blah, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, I am open and I am willing to listen to somebody talk about their baseball opinion because it's different than mine. I can disagree with that opinion and then state my reasons for it. So that's good baseball debate. I don't hold these guys or ladies to a different standard than anybody else who's voting for something that is really of no consequence. These people who are getting into the Hall of Fame, they have great times, and it's going to be a lifelong achievement. But the people who fall short, I know that's going to make them crestfallen, but in the grand scheme, no one's getting hurt. Some people are enjoying some life. The votes are not that serious. And so as long as you explain yourself, and you don't even actually need to explain yourself, but I think if you owe it to the people who are reading your newspaper, reading your articles, to explain why you voted for certain people and why you didn't vote for other people or why you changed your mind. And if they give, the, give, you, give you that, I think you really can't really be mad at them as long as it's a clear, concise uh, reason why they voted for these people. And real quick, I said I wanted to give credit to the BBWA for uh, being more inclusionary and uh, having uh, maybe more 10-player uh, ballots because um, – it went up from last year. Uh, there was 45 in 2023, and there were 70 this year. However, I have to lambast them. I thought I was going to praise them for this, but this has actually gone down since 2017. This has been tracked by uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame uh, tracker team, uh, Ryan Thibodeau, Adam Dore, et cetera. In 2017, there was 162 10-player ballots. There were 174 10-player ballots in 2018. In 2019, there was 168 10-player ballots. In 2020, there were 78. In 2021, there was 51. In 2022, there was 116. Again, in 2023, only 45. And in 2024, 70. So usually there's 100 plus. Um, and there's been three numbers since 2021 where there's been a uh, ballots of 100 less uh, 10 player ballots. I understand that, hey, maybe some people are, again, staking their claim against steroid guys and we're kind of getting more and more into those steroid eras. So maybe that's why people are doing that. But like Ken Rosenthal said today that he wasn't really sure about Felix Hernandez's case. Who will be on the ballot next year. Who will be on the ballot next year. Uh, Felix Hernandez will be on the ballot next year uh, along with Ichiro Suzuki and CeCe Sabathia. You also have others like Curtis Granderson, Ian Kinsler, Dustin Pedroia, Hanley Ramirez, Troy Tulowinski, Ben Zobrist. Apparently only middle infielders are allowed uh, in the 2025 class. Um, And not a lot of pitchers. No, not a lot of pitchers. Um, You obviously have two that I think are first ballots. Um, Some people are questioning CeCe, but he's got over 3,000 strikeouts. He has, I think, those big moments too, winning a championship with the 2009 Yankees and obviously that 2008 trade from Cleveland to Milwaukee where he just became the guy for Milwaukee (laughs) and just pitched every single day. He was like like. the best pitcher in the history of baseball for two months. Oh, yeah. (laughs) But what I don't get is when guys like Ken, and this is a specific gripe with a specific baseball writer, it's not the entire BBWA, but Ken says, and this is kind of the older thinking that I just don't understand. Ken on Felix Hernandez's Hall of Fame case. Brilliant career, was overused by the Mariners. How do you gauge that? From 20 years old to 30 years old, Felix in 2,300 innings plus, uh, innings pitched, he had a 318 318 ERA, six top 10 finishes in the Cy Young, Mm -hmm. and three top two Cy Young finishes. Um, From 20 years old to 30 years old since 1920, Felix, who, uh, among starting pitchers who threw 2,000-plus innings, ranks 7th in Ks behind Burt Blylevin and in front of Tom Seaver, 10th in F War, 12th in ERA minus, so the, you know, if it's the opposite of ERA plus, you know, he's then uh, nearly top 10 in just good guys. In, in preventing runs, uh, 16th in whip, 24th in innings pitched, and 27th in FIP. Uh, he's also nearly like 25th in, in wins. I know that's a, a weird stat to use, uh, but he had like over 150 wins uh, from a 20 year old to never a made the playoffs. For a team that never made the playoffs, yeah. <laughs> and for a guy who historically like should have been the Cy Young and didn't win because of his win loss record. Like I, I don't get the the it's so snooty, right? Like it has to be you like. 
there's a waiting period. You have to wait five years. Like, is Shohei Otani going to have to wait, or can he just retire and just be a Hall of Famer immediately <laughs> for the three years that he had since 2021 to 2023? Like, why wouldn't Shohei Otani be a Hall of Famer already for what he's accomplished? Like, I, I don't get it. I, I don't get the... Like, Adrian Beltre wasn't 100% Hall of Famer. He got 3,000 hits. He was an MVP. Great what, defensively. What, what, what holds him? Great defensively. You said he's the second best third baseman behind Michael Jack Smith. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, pretty hard to debate. Yeah. What are we holding back? Why do we have to be so inclu- inclusionary? Like, the Basketball Hall of Fame is notably oh my garbage. God. Everybody come in. Like, <laughs> bring the, your ass in here. The, the Baseball Hall of Fame is it's like very guarded, very closed off, and yeah. not really fun. The Basketball Hall of Fame might be a little bit too fun, but also, you know, people enjoy basketball. Well, f- football Hall of Fame is kind of the just in the middle of that. But, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Like, I mean, and that's the thing, too. It's the, the year you go in, too. Like, he Felix doesn't have any competition, really. Like, he'll have the competition from people who go over from this year. Is Sheffield done, right, with his 10th time? He's, like, over? Yeah. Uh, he can't Sheffield, get I think, finished with... Oh, sorry. This is not working. Just uh, Sheffield finished with 63.9% of the vote. So he's not going in. And it's probably going to be him and Billy Wagner who's uh, going in probably next year because he finished, what, five votes short. So it's also what year are you going in? It's a smart year to retire for uh, Felix Hernandez because I think, obviously, he's a Hall of Famer. I don't know about first ballot. I don't know if you guys can put weight into her uh, first ballot Hall of Famer or not. At the end of that, when you go back to Cooperstown with your name on it, they don't care if you're a first ballot. It doesn't say on the plaque, I don't think, that you're a first ballot Hall of Famer. Just have your plaque and have your stats down there. And so I think it's a good thing when you do have a person that is that dominant. And of that era, he was one of the best pitchers in the game. To me, that's a check mark. You're in 100%. I don't care what he did at the end of his career. Of course, you're going to have natural regression to a mean or to being older. But he was a dominant pitcher in Seattle. No one wanted to see. Remind me of Freddie Garcia. He had a great 10-year career uh, that everyone would be jealous of and would want. But, uh, you know, he's not Get a hot out of here. Right, yeah. He's first, first, first perfect game I ever threw in on MVP baseball was with Freddie Garcia Mariners. Yeah. Oh, yeah. hell yeah. <laughs> We're in the retro unis, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very nice. I can still remember him doing this. <laughs> at the end of the game, it's like pumped, yeah. Wearing yeah. sleeves, of course. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, and I, I just love that pitching meter too, where it's just got the the yellow and the green in the middle. Just there's something about that 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 color too that just still sticks out in my mind. Uh, all right, um, this is a big home run's gonna hit. Any thoughts on the other Hall of Famers, or should we jump into Burley? Jump into Burley. Okay, let's jump into Burley. Um, you talk about the year that he's gonna be. On the ballot, this is going to be Burley's fifth year on the ballot in 2025. We assume, as you mentioned, uh, Billy Wagner, who was 2.2% away from making the Hall of Fame, will likely make it in on his 10th year. I think that Ichiro Suzuki should be a pretty slam dunk first ballot Hall of Famer. I don't know what's holding him back. Maybe his performance in his 40s. Um, and then Still good. I, I would vote for CC, and I would vote for Felix. Um, so right there, that's... Um, four. four votes. And I mean, I think there were some, I mean, I, I'm, I don't have the complete list in front of me of who would be carried over from this year to the next. Chase Utley comes to mind. Mm-hmm. And there's, as you mentioned, a bunch of middle infielders. I think second base, you know, yeah. there are guys with really good cases. Dustin Pedroia, even he's Ian Kinsler, that have good cases to be made. Whether you want to vote for them or not, it's up to the individual person. But, um, you know, it's not like it's uninteresting. It's not like it's all, you know, a bunch of guys that you turn your nose up at. It's definitely, there are definitely going to be able to, people, there are definitely people who are going to be able to put 10 names down on their ballots next year. Four players, uh, well, no, uh, is it four? I think, well, not including Sheffield because he's off the list. Yeah. Um, Wagner was over 50% at 73.8%. Andrew Jones was at 61.6%. He's he's going into his eighth year. Um, And then Beltron was at 57.1%. So those are the guys over 50%. I would also vote for A-Rod. The only other guy in his ninth year besides Wagner. Nope, Wagner's the only guy in his ninth year. So you won't get any of those guys that, like, oh, I got to kind of save him. Um, we did see more love for Omar Vizquel, which is kind of gross. Like, nothing changed with his case besides more details about his disgusting uh, actions. So, it's like, why why are we seeing a bump in his percentage? But again, kind of once these guys get later and later into their uh, ballot, we, we do see a little bit more of an increase in, in people voting for him. Um, but let's go to Burley's stats real quick. 
um, and then we'll jump into his case and why I think maybe if you can hold on, he might be a Hall of Famer. So thank you, Sarah, for flashing this graphic. Burley's first year on the ballot was 2021. He received 44 votes and 11% of the vote total. In 2022, he received 23% of the votes, 5.8% of the total. In 2023, he had 42 votes, 10.8% of the total. And then 2024, 32 votes and 8.3% total. I do think that that 23 year is a little bit misleading. Um, You had Bonds in his 10th year, Clemens in his 10th year. People had to vote for Helton, who's now a Hall of Famer. Uh, they had to vote for Wagner. Sosa was in his 10th year. Schilling was in his 10th year. Uh, it was A-Rod's first year, Ortiz's first year. There's a lot of names added on to that. I don't think it's going to be that hectic and that tight. Like People, I think, are clearly going to vote for Ichiro. Maybe they'll hem and haw about Sabathia. Maybe they want to vote Pettit in before Sabathia or early in before Sabathia because they're lefties. Baseball writers are weird, but I don't think there's a huge case that, you know, if you are a 10 ballot voter and you are, and there was about 70 of those, I think Burley could probably get like 30 votes again. Like I think the more 10, ba- uh, 10 player ballots we see, the likelier that he gets, you know, over that 23 vote threshold that was his lowest. Um, so I think survival is going to be fairly easy again. For Burley, I think that he could be somebody that doesn't get knocked off because it doesn't seem like baseball writers are eager to really induct people. The I think the best thing Burley has going for him, you can read off as many stats as you'd like, and certainly he's a guy that has a lot of good ones and a guy who has accomplished a lot of great things. I think the thing that he has going for him in favor of him acquiring enough votes to get in is being unique. Right, I mean, I think the idea that you're not sitting there comparing one player who did ex- who was exactly the same to another player who was exactly the same and trying to split hairs over who is both of them, you have this guy over here. It's like, oh, that's an interesting that's an interesting case, and and it's less um, about you know the ERA and the strikeouts and and stuff like that and the time of game and the style of pitching and the you know all of that obviously he won a world series he threw a perfect game he had a, a, a no hitter to go along with it those are hall of fame type accomplishments absolutely uh, and i don't think anyone is doubting uh, that part of it i think the thing is you know you've probably got a lot of people sitting there with a spreadsheet saying do the stats line up and they might not do it but the thing that he is going for him is that He's Mark Burley, and that other guy is not. You know what I mean? That other guy, as good as he was, as great as he was, might just be the best version of all the other guys that were playing at the same time as him, whereas Mark Burley is a rarity, uh, at least in his generation of baseball. So I think that the more people the more people know about that, the more people you have going looking at that ballot and saying, oh boy, that guy did that guy did it in an interesting way. That's a that's a story. That's not just a guy who was good. That's a that's a great story because of the 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 difference that he made with other folks. I mean, there are seven people that threw a perfect game and a no hitter. Two different games: Sandy Koufax, Cy Young, Roy Halladay, Randy Johnson, Jim Budding, and Addie Joss. All of those guys, except for Burley, are in the Hall of Fame. There are seven people who threw 14 consecutive innings or 14 consecutive seasons with 200 innings or more. And Burley misses 15th by an inning and a third, I believe. Chrissy Matheson, Matt, uh, Warren Spahn, Greg Maddox, Gaylord Perry, Phil Necro, Don Sutton. All those guys, Hall of Famers. Three times facing the minimum for Mark Burley. I mean, he has numbers. Only player to do that. Only player to do that. Like, he has numbers. And his, we're just leaving out his defensive prowess, too bunch of gold gloves he think he had in his career uh, 87 defensive run saved since they started counting in this and this is me picking off a mlb.com article they started counting defensive run saved i think in 2003 so they cut off like three or four of his or three of his years that he was doing well in and so him and jack Rinky on the same level for defensive run saved the man has credentials initially when his career ended i was like man really great career probably not a hall of famer but as, as much as you look around, and as Jim puts, his case will look better by comparing him to the pitchers that are going in that era because no one's pitching 200 innings anymore, barely, and he did it for 14 seasons. 
No one's pitching as fast as he did, even with the pitch clock. And no one's pitching as he did, as as Vinny said. He's not striking a bunch of people out. And he's not uh, inducing a bunch of ground balls. He's just getting out or pitching to contact, and he's still got a 381 ERA and all these accolades. And that's without saying the World Series stuff that he did and all the accolades he has off the field, like uh, uh, him just being a quality guy. But I think as soon, like he probably won't get voted in in the 10-year period that he's eligible to, but I think in those extra, like the Veterans Committee or the, hey, we messed up type of committee, somebody will say, yeah, Mark Burley, he should be in. Like how Harold Baines got in. Mm -hmm. One of those type of committees where, yes, Mark Burley in the 2000s, he might have not been the best pitcher, but every time you had to face him, Mark Burley was getting you out, and he was getting dubs. And and I know wins are not a real great stat, but he had 200 wins. And for a guy who just pitched to contact, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, and he's also, uh, what, top 20 in uh, ground uh, double plays grounded into, uh, 362 tied with Pettit. Um, and he is he and Pettit are the only guys that are under 3,500 innings in this stat. Or, no, Claude Austin is also in there at 3,460. What do you pitch, like in the 1800s? Uh, 57 to 75. So I thought that was like your high school years. Pretty much. Oof. Um, Oof. Pretty much. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, uh, might as well be. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, even even on top of that, I mean, you talk about just his defensive prowess, uh, adding on that he's ninth all-time for starters in stolen bases allowed, stolen base percentage allowed, uh, second in pickoffs with 100 just behind uh, – Carlton, and then one of seven pitchers to allow less than 60 stolen bases. Uh, he's He was just a really good defense. Like, he was a, a true ninth defender. Yeah, ninth defender out there. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you really don't get the pitcher to be involved, but with the way that he pitched, he had to be actively involved uh, in, in the defensive side, and he was he was excellent. Um, and one Andy, game he pitched, he gave up seven runs in the first inning. I think it was the Twins or the Royals. Seven runs in the first inning, and then won that game. Because he, that was what he gave up. And then it was, you know, the White Sox came back and won that game. It was, I would say, his versus the Twins at the Metro Dump. And also he held the record for most consecutive uh, batters out in a, like in a string. After right. his perfect game, he went to Minnesota and got, like, extra people out. And I think it was 45 most consecutive batters out in a, in a row. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think he took that into the, like, sixth inning or something like that. Uh, just absolutely insane. And then he broke Jinx's record, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, like his previous no-hitter of the game was completely exactly two hours and three minutes. On July 28th, his next appearance, Spurley retired the first 17 batters he faced before finally allowing a batter in the sixth inning, setting an MLB record of four consecutive outs at 45, which was later broken by who? Uh, Irvin Santana. No, Yusmiro Petit. Uh, Burley became the only <laughs> pitch, uh, third pitcher in MLB history, joining Cy Young and Sandy Koufax to have a no-hitter, perfect game, and World Series title with the same team. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, I do think Burley has an interesting case as long as he can hold on and survive. We'll take a break and talk about the next White Sox to be enshrined in the Hall of Fame, who that will be. But let's have Herb tell you about game time. Eh, you shouldn't have to worry about when you're buying tickets for your next big, big event. Game time has you covered. Because there's a fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying. And the personal experience that I've had is multiple times, but the one in Atlanta is the one I talk about the most. I went down to Atlanta, Truist Park, to get some tickets, watch the uh, Braves play down there, found some tickets on Game Time. Wanted to test them out and see if this game time guarantee was real. Went to all the secondary markets. One of them had a better price than the in the row and section than game time. So I sent this information to game time. And within 12 minutes of that interaction, I had the difference into my account, $46 into my account. They have last minute de ticket deals, flash deals, zone deals. Game time makes it easy to find and buy tickets for every kind of event that you want. You could see the view from your seat, which is very important if you're going to Wrigley or the new 78, which I hope they will have a nice close ballpark. So you could see exactly where you'll be seeing where the skyline is for the White Sox. All in prices show you total up front so you know what you're getting. Buy tickets in seconds with two taps. Game time has deals 
on games right up to the event. Even if it's an hour after the event starts, it's the place to be for last minute tickets. Find exclusive flash deals and sponsor deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. And with zone deals, you can pick the section you want. Game time picks the seats for an average savings of 18%. What you need to do right now is to go to game time. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets. Download the game time app. Create an account. Use the code CHGO for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. And redeem code CHGO for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. And if you are in the market for a new vehicle, oh, you're all good. What, you, no, you want to play this? The... I was just going to put an emphasis on like Game Time. So what the, is the lion? Is the Hulk roar. Oh. oh. Okay. <laughs> Continue, Boom. continue. Yeah, you're all good. Are you in the market for a new vehicle? If you are, then we have some great news for you. Our partner, Ray Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram in Fox Lake is starting their Ray Resolution with the Start Something New sales event. And you know what that means? You'll be able to shop incredible savings on every new vehicle in stock because they want to clear out the lot to make room for brand new 2024 vehicles. For a limited time, get up to $9,000 off a new or on new Jeep models with dealer discounts. And that's not all. Shop their last call on remaining 2023 Dodge Challenger and Charger models, including Hellcats, Scat Packs, and more. Dodge is the most powerful muscle car brand, so you don't want to miss out on their last call with over 20 Dodge muscle cars to choose from. At Ray, CDJR, you'll always be able to shop one of Chicagoland's largest inventories and drive home with more money in your pocket than you'd expect. Thank you. Thanks to Ray's Price Promise. Don't miss out. Shop great deals all month long and save big because Ray CDJR makes buying a new vehicle more affordable than ever. Fans can get a free oil change when you mention CHGO at the service center or mention CHGO when you book online at raycdjr.com slash service. That's raycdjr.com slash service, but you have to schedule it before January 31st. If you're in the market for a new vehicle, then you have to check out the team at Ray Chrysler Dodge Jeep and Ram because they're the only team we recommend. Visit them today on Route 12 in Fox Lake. For more information, you should visit Ray CDJR in Fox Lake or raycdjr.com, serving the community since 1963. Let's talk about the next uh, White Sox to possibly be enshrined to the Hall of Fame. We do want to let you know to hit that thumbs up button. And also, I think we do have a super chat that I missed. I was trying to get that in the second uh, segment, but I forgot about it. Our guy, Ellie, uh, coming in with a $5 super chat. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, they should have a CHGO Hall of Fame. Uh, my nation will be Vinny Nation. Will be Vinny. So your first nomination, I think, it will, wow. be, will, be, will be Vinny. So All right. Well, thank you, sir. Vinny's our Appreciate first it. CHGO Hall of Famer. It. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Tip of that. Congratulations. It was that diehard mailbag that put you over the top. Yeah. So congrats. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, you're, you're I annual. was borderline until until that one went up. <laughs> your annual push push mailbag. push the batting average to where it needed to be. You're just like John Cruck. He got up to 300 and then retired. There you go. He, last at bat uh, was with the White Sox. He got a single and then said, "I'm good." Just drove home. There you go. Before the game even finished. That's a great story. Yeah. Uh, well, it, what? You're not first ballot, year. according to law. Well, oh, he's got to retire for five years, yeah. right? Plus, well, I've got to be retired for five years. That's not happening anytime soon. I'm well. I'm glad you guys brought this up because obviously you're not going to retire anytime soon because you're closing in on your uh, BBWA Hall of Fame vote. Um, but Joe Maurer is not 41 years old. That this is from uh, baseball r slash baseball on Reddit. Uh, Joe Maurer is not yet 41 years old. Of Hall of Famers who were both a alive at the time of election and b subject to a five year waiting period. Maurer is the second youngest behind only Sandy Koufax. Sandy Koufax was inducted into the Hall of Fame at 36 years and 21 days. Maurer is the second youngest uh, at tw- uh, 40 years, 20, 279 days. Uh, Catfish Hunter was also uh, j- uh, just barely beaten out by two days, uh, 40 years, 281 days. And then Kirby Puckett, also under 40. Uh, he was forced to retire due to illness. But out of guys that just retired... Um, Kofax, Maurer, and Catfish Hunter are the youngest players to ever be enshrined. I think um, somebody's going to try to beat that. Buster Posey, I think, retired when he was like 35 himself. So he might be, uh, what, four years from now eligible? Because I think everybody knows that Buster's probably a Hall of Famer. You'd think so. He's 36 right now. Um, I think he's got a shot. I think he's born before, I think Maurer had an April birthday. Okay. And po- Posey has a March birthday. So... That could be the decider there by like <laughs> days, but it's it's a good thought because I, I I agree. I mean, what is holding back a seven time All Star, five time Silver Slugger, three time World Series champion, a Gold Glove, batting title, Rookie of the Year, and MVP 
uh, out of the Hall of Fame. Goodness he's, gracious. He's not at 45 war. His career was like that. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, literally. And in his, his career, uh, in his true career from 2010, because I won't count the seven games as a rookie, uh, he slashed 302, 372, 461. An OPS of 129 was a part of three World Series teams in uh, only 11 years. Yeah. Only 11 years. Ken Rosenthal is clutching his pearls right now uh, over only playing 11 years. Uh, Christ. Uh, so, yeah. Hey, uh, anyways, Buster Posey might be the next uh, young guy inducted. Next White Sox to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Who will it be? I know White Sox Tom brought up Jose Abreu, last White Sox to win the MVP. Frank Thomas already in. Maybe your guy Robin Ventura gets some love at, love at some it. point. I mean, he was great. I yeah. think... Go ahead. I mean, I, 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 you might be able to come up with a name that I'm not thinking of right now because I'm thinking of guys who were White Sox for a long time. Maybe there's a guy in there that would be, you know, who made a, a cameo appearance that I'm not remembering right now. For example, James Shields was on the ballot this year oh, wait, and got you? zero votes. But, that was more uh, than a cameo, though. It, true. That's a but horror I guess film. My point, my answer, I think, is going to be Chris Sale. That would be my answer. answer. I think that's probably got to be the obvious one, right? Great answer. Great um, answer. I don't think Jose Abreu is a bad discussion point, no. but I'm not quite sure I see him reaching the heights that would require you to get into the Hall of Fame, whereas Chris Sale has put up the years and statistics necessary to already kind of assure the fact that he's going to be in there, not to mention starring for a World Series winning team after he left the White Sox, which were his best years. So um, I think he's probably... A, a first ballot Hall of Famer whenever he arrives, but uh, but Jose Abreu is like I said an interesting discussion point. I don't know if necessarily this is a White Sox because he only played for three years, but Dick Allen needs to be it's a White the, Sox. Uh, yeah, he needs well, to MVP be, is. A, I understand, but like you know, you he if you're going in as something, I don't know if he goes in as the White Sox. I don't even know if they do that anymore. But he would be my guy because I think there's another one of those uh, veteran things in like three or four years, and so I think Chris won't be retired enough or right. retired at that time. Yeah. I think Dick Allen would be getting the nod. Now, Jose Abreu is a good answer, but I don't think he's close to the numbers you need to be as a first baseman to be a Hall of Famer. He was a great White Sox, and we'll have his number retired by them, but Chris Sale already has the numbers, I believe, to get into the Hall of Fame and the status, too, because of his White Sox career. And his Red Sox career, while hurt a lot, phenomenal so just to update the dick allen one is an interesting one uh the eras committee formerly known as the veterans committee and this is from the baseballhall.org just to explain this process considers retired major league players no longer no longer eligible for election by the baseball writers association of america along with managers umpires and executives whose greatest contributions to the game were realized either prior to 1980 or after 1980 uh there are three ballots there's the contemporary baseball era consisting of the period from 1980 to present day so if a robin ventura who has already gotten his uh you know eligibility on the ballot up uh he could be nominated for the contemporary baseball era fred mcgriff was just a part of that uh era and that ballot uh the next time the classic base or the contemporary uh ballot will vote on is december of 2025 during the winter meetings for inclusion of the uh, 2026 class the classic baseball era consists of the period prior to 1980, so that would be Dick Allen, uh, and including Negro League and pre-Negro League stars, uh, December of 2024 uh, for the inclusion oh, wow. of 2025. He was not included on the ballot. Cito Gaston, Davey Johnson, Jim Leland, Ed, Ed Montague, Hank Peters, Lou Piniella, uh, Joe West, and Bill White were included uh, on the that ballot and then there's the contemporary baseball era uh it splits into two separate ballots one ballot to consider only players who made their greatest impact on the game since 1980 and another composite ballot consisting of managers executives and umpires whose greatest contributions to the game have come since 1980 uh that will be taking place for december of 2026 for inclusion of the class of 2027 that just happened that's how jim leland got in was that what you just talked about right so i'm I'm confused oh yeah okay so so the next one that will be voted on is Hopefully, the classic baseball era, which would include that would be Dick this Allen. winter, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. Dick Allen or next winter. Okay, yeah. so I, I tried to explain it to everybody, and I actually didn't understand it myself. Um, and so, that's how. Well, I guess uh, the contemporary one was how Fred McGriff, as you mentioned, just got in, as well as Harold Baines, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think that Robin has an interesting case. Uh, a one fourteen OPS plus six gold gloves, fifty six WAR. Um, I don't. I don't see why Robin Ventura shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. Um, again, I'm I'm more the more for the merrier. Uh, or, no, that's not the 
case. Uh, I'm, I'm of the more of more more is. You're of the Please. opinion that the more, the merrier. Thank Boom. you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm cool with Robin being considered on that era. I'm cool with Dick Allen being considered. And I think like the true next player that would be voted in is Chris Sale. And I think Chris Sale... Would Chris Sale well, Chris Sale would have to retire. He's 35 I, now, that, I believe. That would just mean Bar- Burley doesn't get in. I don't think Burley gets in. No, not But about, I think that he has a, a chance to get to maybe 9 to 10 years. I think that he's a person that if he can kind of withstand this, maybe get to 30%, which is huge. I mean, that's, Absolutely, I mean, if, yeah. if he can cross over that threshold and maybe just consistently build um, the next milestone for Burley's candidacy is 50 votes. Let's get to 50, 50 votes next year. Um, and again, he's an interesting person, but I don't know if he's got the actual stuff. Sales got the stuff. I'm just, well, I'm just looking to, I'm not, you know, I, I said Chris Sale, that wasn't to say that I don't think Mark Burley belongs in the Hall of Fame necessarily, just saying that um, you showed the voting numbers. They're not growing by leaps and bounds yep. every single year, even though there is fluctuation. You know, to to see a guy who's basically halfway home, a little less, but halfway home, and still struggling at times to get above 10%, right. I don't see that growing to 75 over six more ballots, right? That's just usually not how that works. So um, it, it would seem that, you know, that that large leap is probably pretty impossible. But he is a guy that, I mean, hey, if you have a strong 10-year run on the ballot and you just get missed out, maybe you, you get lucky and you get included on one of these absolutely you know, extraneous ballots. And to further your point about Robin, as Justin put, 18 Grand Slams. And if you look at the career Grand Slams in the history of baseball, you see some all-the-time great Baseball players, and then Rob Ventura. It's like Willie McCovey, A Rod, Manny Ramirez, Rob Ventura. I'm not putting a guy in because he hit grand slams. Hey, man, those are clutch hits, man. When, sure, when the bases but, I mean, are loaded, like, you, you, you wanted no one better than Rob Ventura up on the plate. And the no grand of, slam single is a great thing, too. No offense, that's just not true. I'd rather have A Rod, as you said, A Rod had more grand slams than him. You said you'd want rather have no one on the But the percentage to grand slams. To your other home runs, Robin's one of the best of all time. I guess. I mean, I, 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 if you're, if we're talking about which third baseman who played for a New York team that I want up with the bases loaded, I'm not taking Robin Ventura. You should. You're taking David, I, right? I'm taking Alex Rodriguez. I think A Rod. I mean, uh, Robin might have had a better average than A Rod, but that's for another about? show. Career average? I mean, when bases loaded. Okay, I'll, I'll look that up for you. Uh, one guy I do want to bring up, though, is is Abreu. If Abreu retires after 2022, just plays nine years with the White Sox, hits 292, 354, 507 OPS, or a 507 slugging, an OPS of 860, OPS plus of 135, with an MVP and a Rookie of the Year. It's not bad. Does he make a, does he make a case by being like, just a, a, a phenomenal, if not the best Cuban player of all time with the, those nine years. I don't know. I might be forgetting a Cuban player. I mean, Manny Minoso is in the Hall of Fame. That's true, yeah. but I don't know. We're comparing White Sox careers. Brady might be a better White Sox than Minoso. Statistically. Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, I, I do think it is a it is a interesting discussion point, and I think that um, when you talk about guys who – because, you know, the White Sox are not maybe the most thought of team, particularly during Jose Abreu's tenure because of, of the records that they had. You know, it, it's hard to sometimes deal with the voters who are on the West Coast or the voters who are on the East Coast and, and have them remember some of these teams. The, you know, there are going to be people next year who are going to say, wow, I, don't re- I didn't remember how good Felix Hernandez was. There were, you know, there were probably people over the last several years who were like, wow, I can't believe Todd Helton was that good because – why was I ever paying attention to the Colorado Rockies kind of thing? So there are probably going to be some people who see Jose Abreu's numbers when, when the time comes and be like, oh, man, I wasn't paying attention to those rebuilding era White Sox teams, but, boy, that guy was putting up numbers consistently. So I do think it's an interesting discussion point. I, I think there are going to be people who vote for him, certainly. Um, you know, it's just at the end of the day, is he going to end up getting that 75% number? And if we're not looking at Burley, the other guys that could possibly close in that are quote unquote White Sox uh, in 2026, Edwin Encarnacion will be a first timer on the ballot. Nope. It will be Manny Ramirez's last year on the ballot. He is a White Sox. Um, and then uh, in 2027, we also have Andrew Jones's last year on the ballot. Um, does he count as a White Sox? I mean, he, he, might, he played for them. Just, we yeah, wouldn't I put the hat is. on, but I think he is fourth one to the throne room as a White Sox. Um, oh, you know what's crazy? 2028. 
the first-time candidates, Albert Pujols, Yadi Molina, Steven Strasburg. Wow. I mean, that's weird. Two of those three get in. I mean, true. yeah, Pujols gets in. Uh, Molina should get Eventually in. Eventually I mean, gets in. Strasburg not get in? No. Why? No. He was amazing. Not He was too... Sh- I mean, we're talking about... How many, like, years, yeah, how many full seasons worse did than, he even play? Yeah, yeah. Worse, than, uh, <laughs> worse than... What's it called? He was worse than Felix. Yeah. Um, won a silver slugger. Yeah. Uh, 324 ERA. Never won a Cy Young. Uh, two top five finishes. I don't know. He's just... It just sucks to see you. A guy with so much talent. Like, if we're just basing it off talent, maybe Strasburg gets in. Um, um, Rob Ventura and A-Rod hit the same average, 340. When the bases were loaded? Uh, yeah. On on base was 370 for Robin. It was 387 for A-Rod. And the slugging was 676 for Robin, 695 for Alex Rodriguez. So, yes, Alex Rodriguez with a 1.082 was better than Robin's 1.045. And respectfully, I say this. You're telling me that Alex Rodriguez is a better baseball player slightly, than Robin Ventura. Slightly better. Okay. Uh, with right. the bases loaded. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that you could probably say for sure next White Sox who is like might wear a White Sox hat into the Hall of Fame, Chris Sale. Yeah. But he honestly might wear a – Red Sox had no. Won a no, World Series with no. him. He had more. He had more of his better. Like he wasn't. What was that his high? What was his highest Red Cy Sox. Young finish with the Red Sox? I think he second. Finished second. Yeah. How many? I mean, he uh, he finished second and fourth in 2017 and 2018 for Boston. For Boston, but his um, last four with the Sox were all top five, right? Six. Uh, his or last six, one, yeah. two. Th- his last five seasons, he finished top six. Yeah. Six, five, three, four, five. He, he was, was better a, for longer with the White Sox. Yeah, but he might have had better memories. I mean, he, he pitched well, six years he in Boston, to, seven he years in the White Sox. He doesn't get to pick? No, no you, they asked him. He actually looks at his Boston uh, career as a disappointment because he was injured all the time, mm. even though he won the World Series in 18. Yeah, and had a two five six ERA in 2017 and 2018. But yeah, they can, they can ask, but I don't believe they get to pick what hat they're wearing on their I know, flag. like Andre Dawson's trying to change his right. from the Expos to the Cubs. He wants a new one that, to have a Cub hat on, and they're yeah. not letting him. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. All right. So, Ha! Take that, Chris Sale. You're wearing a White Sox hat. Hopefully you're, you're they put trapped. it in the, the throwback one and, as a little <laughs> humor one. Uh, and, Alec, I don't know about that. If Sale gets in, uh, Strasburg should get in. Uh, Sale, again, has the, the true finishes of Cy Young awards. And, and innings. Mean, yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, he's he's been truly just a, a better pitcher than Strasburg. Uh, but that's going to do it, right? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I, oh. there's... Didn't you have yeah, some sort of surprise thing? It's 430 it's 4.30 we can save and it we have a tomorrow. show tomorrow. Yeah, so yeah. we do. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Colson Montgomery tomorrow, and we'll talk about uh, Vess. If you are a Vess fan, I, I have some unfortunate news. So uh, join us tomorrow at 3.30. That is Vinny Duber. You can follow him at Vinny Duber, and you can check out his diehard mailbag at allchgo.com. That's Herb Lawrence. You can follow him at Actorwall23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. And I'm Sean Anderson. You can follow me at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. And you can follow the show at CHGO underscore White Sox. Hit the thumbs up button and make sure you're subscribed to the CHGO Sports YouTube channel. Thank you to Sarah for producing the show. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Goodbye. <laughs> We all silly like the mayor. 